The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello, welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm Darren Jaime, and today we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up on today's show, we update you on the latest in politics, including the New York Times article featuring President Donald Trump and his alleged tax allegations. Afterwards, in an effort to keep our neighborhood safe, the Bronx District Attorney's Office and the NYPD created the Bronx Gun Buyback Drop-Off Sites designed to exchange guns for cash. We'll give you a little bit more about this a little bit later on in the show. Then, falls are the leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries for older Americans. For the nearly 1.6 million New Yorkers ages 60 and older, falls are a serious threat, but they're often preventable. So we're going to tell you about the efforts from one organization to avoid injuries and much more. And then, the second annual Bronx Alzheimer's Walk just passed, an important event organized by the organization RAIN, raising awareness about this illness. Representatives from the organization will join us in studio to share more. So we want you to stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. And hello, everyone. I'm Darren Jaime, and today is Wednesday, October 3rd, 2018. Of course, you're watching Open, a live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. Now, we want to tell you, our viewers, we want to welcome our viewers, particularly in Manhattan, on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, as Open is now being seen and broadcast live simultaneously on MNN's channel. And you can also stay connected to us via Twitter at BronxNet TV and Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. We're kicking our show off. Gun violence continues to plague the streets of our country. Statistics show every day 96 Americans are killed with guns. Here in the Bronx, there's an effort underway to keep our neighborhoods safer. Authorities are partnering with the community to try and get guns off the streets through the Bronx Gun Buyback Program. These feature drop-off sites that are designed to exchange cash for guns or guns for cash, however you wish to put it. Here to share a little bit more about the program is Assemblyman Victor Pachardo. We welcome you back, and uh, good to have you. Always a pleasure. How's it going? Going good, going good. So obviously, as I said, you know, in the intro, 96 Americans every day are killed with guns. And when it comes to the issue of kids 0 to 19, those numbers continue to rise. And I know here in the borough, mm -hmm. um, you know, a real focused intent. This isn't the first time we've done the gun buyback Absolutely. program. But yeah. let's talk about why you feel this, uh, this program is important. Well, I think taking at least one gun off the street can save countless lives. And, you know, giving a person an incentive to turn in a firearm, no questions asked, I think that's a great thing to do. Again, if the idea is to lessen the amount of firearms that are available on the streets and put them in a safe way where they're disabled and can't harm anybody, I think that's a win-win for everybody. And again, with the incentive as well uh, to pay cash for these guns, I think it, it helps a person out if they're struggling or whatever. But the most important thing is to turn in these firearms, get them off our streets so they can't harm anybody either now or in the future. So let's talk about the program as it is right sure. now. People have the opportunity to turn guns in. How does it work? So first of all, I want to take this opportunity to thank the district attorney, Darcel Clark. I've been pestering her for quite some time to get this one in my district, so I want to take this opportunity to thank her. Um, so basically, a person comes in, um, first of all, if they're transporting a firearm, make sure that it's in a safe position, that it's locked in their trunk. Um, basically, if you trade in an assault rifle or any operating handgun, you get about a $200 prepaid cash card. If you turn in any other type of firearm or weapon, you get a $25 uh, gift card. But again, the firearm itself has to be in operable order. Um, from my understanding, it doesn't have to have bullets. 
but preferably I believe that they shouldn't be having ammunition within the firearm. So bring in the firearm, if it's an operable order, they will disable it in, 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 in front of NYPD and they will get their uh, cash card, but it's only up to three weapons that they'll get the money for, but if they want to turn in more, the more the merrier. How effective has this been? I mean, we've done this for years now across the borough. Uh, what do you, how do you measure its effectiveness? Well, first and foremost, again, it, it comes down to the idea that we have to take any opportunity that we can take a gun off the street is a win because ultimately we can't know for sure if that gun itself would have been used in the issue of the continuance of a crime for whatever reason, right? So it's hard to measure. So the idea that we take these firearms off the street, we're preventing tragedies like happened in my district a couple of weeks ago where a man was shot on 183rd Street and University Avenue a block away from a school in front of his two-year-old daughter and that child's going to be scarred because someone had easy access to firearms and I can guarantee you, Darren, that that firearm was not purchased in the state of New York. That firearm was purchased somewhere in the South. And again, it just comes to this notion that it's so easy to access a firearm that it's just anything that we can do to take these, 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 these war machines off our streets, I think, is a win for everybody. So if somebody's out there watching, they have a relative with sure. themselves, they, they have a firearm, sure. they want to turn it in, sure. they're concerned about possible prosecution, because we know what the state laws are when it comes to possession of a firearm. Talk a little bit about that. So first of all, the, the, this is a no questions asked thing. You show up with a firearm, they disarm it, they, they give you your cash card, they don't look and they don't go through the background check of a firearm. They just, the, the idea is to get this firearm off the street, period. So if, like, let's say if you're living with someone that you know that has a firearm, you want to get rid of it, you can and get some money out of it. But the most important thing, again, is just getting that firearm off the street so it's not used in the commission of a crime or it's not used in the commission of actually ending someone's life or grievously injuring someone in any type of criminal process or whatever. Mm -hmm. So where do people drop this off at if they have? Sure. So first of all, this event, I should lead with this, um, is going to take place on October 13th starting at 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. over at Holy Spirit Church in my district, which is uh, 1940 University Avenue. Um, it's basically right uh, where Burnside Avenue and University Avenue meet um, uh, as Burnside Avenue is a dead end. It's the big church right there. Again, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. the 13th, bring in the firearm. As long as it's in operable order, no questions asked, you'll get, a, uh, you'll get a cash card for it. And again, the most important thing is let's do everything that we can to get these firearms off the street because unfortunately, you know, the federal government is not doing what it's supposed to do in protecting our kids and protecting our community. So we have to figure out ingenious and inventive ways to actually do our, our, our federal legislators' jobs in getting these guns off the street. Let me dial back a little bit on what you talked about the sure. shooting a little while ago sure. in your in your neighborhood. Sure. Uh, give me a little bit about the community right now. What's the what's the atmosphere? What's the temperature like given the given the shooting? Well, look, we myself and a lot of community organizations like Bragg and I am I am my community and organizations that are anti-violence. We did a peace march in the district in one of the hottest areas, which is basically the 183rd Street corridor a couple of weeks ago. And again, people are just sick and tired of the violence that are happening in our communities. Look, you have to. I mean, and again, we, we have to look at gun violence as a public health issue. We have to look at poverty as a public health issue as well. And, and the thing is, these, thing, these two things are interjected. So, again, we, people want to live in, in peace, quiet, and decent neighborhoods. And the ability for folks to actually live or fulfill that, that dream to live in a community that's safe and they feel that's peaceful and they can raise their children in, the biggest factor in determining that is the amount and the presence of firearms that are in our communities. How optimistic are you about the success of this program uh, coming to your neighborhood? Well, I'm very happy. Uh, again, I think uh, any gun, if you take one gun off the street, it's a success, it's a win. Again, we're preventing the potential future tragedies or crimes that are committed to use of that firearm. And again, look, any, anything that we can do to help save a life and remove these firearms off our street, I think it's a great thing. Mm -hmm. So what have you heard from community residents with regards to the program? Have there, has there been great support in terms of doing it? I think, look, I mean, as I said, we, people want guns off the streets. Like every, do, every time I go to a, to a rally, every time I go to a community board meeting, a precinct council meeting, there's quality of life issues. And then everybody talks about, you know, the, I know that kid who's selling drugs on the corner and I've seen him, you know, with the dispute and firearm and all this other stuff. And we have to take these guns off the street. And, you know, people feel that anything their elected officials do, because, again, we are we work for them and not the other way around. 
we have to figure out solutions to get guns off the streets because unfortunately on the federal level they're either too scared, too inept, or too bought out by the NRA to actually do something tangible to help with the issue of gun violence, not only in my community, but in areas where there's been mass shooting events across the country. Yeah, in a little while you're getting ready to get back to Albany, take care of the people's business out of, uh, up at the state capitol. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about legislation for a moment surrounding gun violence. Are you satisfied with the current legislation? I mean, New York State does have strict uh, handgun laws and, and gun legislation, what would you like to see added or, you know, what can we do up there sure. in terms of tightening the reins a little bit? Well, I actually have a piece of legislation that I introduced a couple of years ago that basically says, and unfortunately my jurisdiction is limited, it basically says that if there's a firearm that is being used in the commission of a crime, the last owner on record is going to be held civilly liable for that crime. Unfortunately, because a lot of the guns that are used in the commission of a crime in my community and mostly in the state of New York are firearms that are purchased outside of the state of New York, which means it's outside of the jurisdiction of the state of New York, there's very little that the state of New York can do to prevent that. So I'm taking this opportunity on your program to ask any of my federal colleagues, I have the language, if you want to introduce a similar piece of legislation in the federal level, either in the House or in the Senate, just to do to make people responsible for their firearms and for their property because look if you want to buy a firearm in Kentucky or in Florida or Virginia and you want to protect your family that's your business but what's what becomes my business is that if you buy a firearm and that firearm that you purchase in Virginia ends up in the streets of 183rd Street and University Avenue and it's used in the commission of a crime where a man is shot in front of his two-year-old, there's something seriously wrong there and we need to do everything that we can to prevent these things from happening. Assemblyman Victor Bichardo, we're going to leave it right there. Thanks much and uh, good to have you. Always a pleasure. All right, Assemblyman Victor Bichardo, our guest. Listen, take a quick break. We'll be back with more open, including some Bronx updates and featuring some very special events. Thank you. I guess sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. Your whole world changes in an instant. That's what happened to me the day my mother had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to spot a stroke fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke fast. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment. A moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments, goofy moments, sporty moments, dorky moments, kooky moments. Moments where we talk or walk or just hang out. It doesn't really matter. They all count because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. And welcome back. A lot has certainly been going on through this past week. We're going to take you through it with some Bronx updates featuring some very special events. Well, as we said with our Bronx updates, today we're going to talk about some very special events. We're going to encourage you to come on out and get active in your neighborhood park. Bronxites who are 60 years and older are welcome to participate in free tennis lessons, yoga, and fitness in 16 neighborhood parks across the city. Now, activities in the six-week senior free fitness program will be taking place twice a week, and all equipment is provided. Now, if you want more information, you can call 718-760-6999 
or you can email sports at cityparksfoundation.org. In other news, on Thursday, October 4th, NYC Parks and the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment will be showing a free film. We encourage you to come on out with your family and watch a movie under the stars. The movie, A Wrinkle in Time, will be showing from 4 to 7 p.m. And be sure to get there before 4 p.m. to get your spot. Now, feel free to bring a blanket to sit on. There will be some limited supply of chairs and reservations are not being taken. So space is on an available first-come, first-served basis, but all are welcome. Now, Movies Under the Stars will be at the West Bronx Recreation Center. That's located at 1527 Jessup Avenue. For more information, you can contact 718-430-1825. Once again, that number is 718-430-1285. And finally, on Saturday, October the 20th, join the Bronx River Alliance on a paddling adventure and explore the freshwater sections of the Bronx River. Registration opens two weeks prior to the trip date at 10 a.m. and ends before the trip at 10 a.m. There's also a limited amount of 20 tickets. The cost is $15 for children, $30 for adults. The event will be located at 219th Street and Bronx Boulevard in Shoelace Park. Now, if you want to contact the Bronx River Alliance, this is what you do. You call 718-430-4665 or email paddle at bronxriver.org. Well, that's all the time we have for Bronx Updates. We're going to be right back right after this. Cheru has no choice. She and millions like her walk miles a day for dirty water. But together, we can end their walk by providing clean water close by. Instead of spending hours walking to get water that makes them sick, girls can be in a classroom and moms will gain back time to care for their families. Sons and daughters can grow up strong, finally free of sicknesses. It's true. When you just add water, you change a life. Learn more at worldvision.org. And thank you for staying with us. President Donald Trump is on the defensive. This after an explosive article released by the New York Times claiming the president evaded taxes for himself and his father, among several other allegations of illegalities and improprieties. Welcome now, Michael Benjamin, associate editor of the editorial, I should say the associate editor of the editorial page of the New York Post. I should know that by now as much as we've talked to Mike. Mike, good to have you. Glad to be on, Darren. Good morning. How are you? Hey, I'm doing good, doing good. Let's uh, get right at it. Let's talk about this new article coming out by the New York Times, really exposing uh, President Trump talking about these financial improprieties. Uh, the initial thought is the president was out on the campaign trail saying, listen, I got a million dollars from my father. This is how I got my start. But after reading this article and what we found in this article, things are totally different. Yeah, it appears to be, according to the Times report, uh, it seems that his dad, uh, Fred Trump, uh, engage in some uh, rather creative accounting to avoid uh, inheritance taxes and to uh, undervalue uh, his properties. Um, it, it, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good for the Trump family, particularly now that New York State Department of Taxation and Finance says they will look into the matter to see if there was any tax fraud that went on. As apparently the time story seems to allege, you know, one of the taxes that the, the Trump family may have been trying to avoid was uh, the 55 percent uh, inheritance tax. And so what the alleged scheme, according to the Times, involved the creation of a, uh, of a shell company, uh, all count, some sort of a supply and maintenance company that would bill uh, Fred Trump's companies for equipment and supplies at overly inflated prices. And the, uh, I guess the excess would then be transferred to the Trump children as they could pocket without paying any, any inheritance taxes on yeah, and this scheme went on for a number of years, and it avoided a big lump sum that would have been taxable under the, under U.S. inheritance laws. Well, when we look at the president, I have some numbers here. By age three, he, uh, Mr. Trump was earning $200,000 a year considerably in today's uh, economy. Uh, by the time he was 17, he had part ownership of a 52-unit apartment building. And then uh, he was receiving basically the equivalent of a million dollars a year from his father to more than $5 million annually in his 40s and 50s. And for someone that uh, has alleged that really he's come up by his own bootstraps, looking at these things with the inheritance tax and all this other stuff, uh, where do we see this going? Because uh, you, you, you see where he's come from, you see where he is, and we know the amount of bankruptcies. Former New York State Attorney General Eric Schneiderman said he was opening up an investigation. Can we expect even more coming out of the uh, State Attorney General's office? 
It's, as I say, yes, State Attorney General's office. I'm certain that the, the governor has said he's directing his Department of uh, State Taxation and Finance to look into the matter as well. Yeah, they're going to go back years, and they have subpoena power, and they could subpoena records from the Trump organization uh, to see uh, you know, what exactly was filed and was there an effort, uh, as the time seems to allege, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to avoid taxes. And also, the Times talks about the article also in, in the window that, that the fact was that uh, Fred Trump used uh, some of some of this uh, overvalued uh, supplies and, and renovation of his property to then seek uh, MCI, major capital improvement uh, credit, so he could then raise the rent on the renters in, in his building. And using those overinflated prices allowed him to, to raise the, the rent much higher than he normally would have been able to. And that could lead to uh, reforms now that they have been talked about in the MCI program as a result of uh, this uh, bombshell report in uh, today's New York Times. Talking about the president, of course, he's on the defensive. Talking about the New York Times has put a, a, a hit out on him uh, and that the media is really, once again, attacking him. Uh, but one more reason for criticism comes out of his recent comments in South Haven, Mississippi, uh, talking about uh, Christy Blakely Ford, uh, the lady that accused uh, Supreme Court Justice nomination, uh, nominee, I should say, Brett Kavanaugh, of uh, sexual assault, uh, the president actually mocking her. Uh, what do you think this does in terms of credibility for the president? Because there's one thing for sure, he does have a base, but uh, even those people who are within his base, some people are cringing at this latest one. Absolutely. I mean, it's hard to believe that, that President Trump has any sort of credibility uh, with anyone in, in the United States. Uh, given his uh, his history of of exaggeration, uh, out, outright lies, his uh, history of uh, saying one thing one day and the next day he changed his mind and, and saying something else. Uh, over the weekend, he last week, he was uh, you know supportive of a Dr. Ford, saying that you know she ought to be heard and 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 we ought to be given to what she said. He said that her testimony in front of the uh, judiciary committee was credible. And then yes, last night he goes on a stage and he starts mocking her. Uh, there's, there's there's something definitely wrong with with the president of the United States when he when, when he behaves in that matter and and now I'm certain he's going to go off on a, on a Twitter tirade against what he's calling the failing New York Times for what he's calling a, a hit on him. But they're using facts that are there, and there have been many questions about his taxes, and he has yet to release his own personal tax return, as uh, many uh, past presidential candidates and presidents have done. Yeah, I know some people talked about the fact that he's questioned uh, former President Obama looking for a birth certificate and actually forced the president to produce his birth certificate. Many people are still questioning the fact of whether or not he will ever, ever, ever uh, give his actual tax returns. I want to turn to another topic real quick, and I want to talk about the RFK uh, charity. And, uh, you know, bring us up to speed with the RFK charity and uh, some of these latest people who have been actually released to the RFK charity uh, have been under scrutiny. Yes, the uh, Robert Kennedy uh, Human Rights Foundation has started a, uh, a bailout program that they've been running across the country. They're now bringing it to New York to highlight the deficiencies and injustice that's in the, uh, the cash bail system. Um, they put together a $5 million fund where they plan to bail out between 400 and 500 New Yorkers, uh, primarily women and teenagers, who are held on cash bail at Rikers. Oh, well, the teenagers are not being held at uh, youth facilities uh, in the Bronx and, and, and Brooklyn. Um, I believe uh, they were able to free on bail about a dozen people on Monday. And the New York Post reports today that one of the uh, free defenders uh, is, is a woman named um, Ralphie Myrie, who's, uh, who's been a, sort of a, a, a violent uh, robber, uh, a thief. And uh, he has a history of, uh, of violent robberies and, and violence, but she was bailed out by, by the fund, and uh, her latest victims uh, are afraid that she may return and, uh, and, and do harm to them. Um, one of the reasons why she was held on bail is that the judge and the prosecutors believe that she was a, a risk you know, to not return to court. Um, the fund, the idea is nice. When you want to bail out people who, who are, are being held on charges that are not violent charges and are not dangerous to, to the community, and, and if their families you know, can't meet a minimum bail of $2,500, then, yeah, somebody ought to, ought to be able to help them to, to be free. Because I, I believe 
a person who's accused of a crime ought to be able to have bail or actually be released without bail so they can regularly meet with their attorney and create a defense so that they can properly defend themselves and not wind up being forced you know, to, to, to top a plea because they want to do as little time in it as possible. Yeah, and we talk about this, you know, when we had the people from Cash Bail on, uh, supporting the fact of, you, you know, making sure that this cash bail reform was taken care of, that the big thing was those people who committed serious offenses and uh, if they were, you know, with bail, they would be definitely remanded. But it seems in this particular case, a major ball has been dropped. Uh, how do you get to the place? And is there any discoveries? How did they get to the place for the discovery of how she was picked as opposed to others? Well, our bail is $25,000. And uh, anyone, any individual come forward and help her with her bail. Uh, I was able to put down, I guess, $2,500 uh, to, to have her uh, released on bail. The opposition and trouble, I guess, we have at, at the post on the post editorial board is that we're afraid that you know, the RFK fund will be releasing people who uh, you know, could be uh, our threat to the local, local community. And they're talking about releasing teenagers. You know, some of these teenagers are are suspected violent offenders. You know, some of them belong to uh, major gangs, like a Trinitario, who murdered that young man uh, in the uh, in the Bronx, in the West Bronx, uh, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have other gang members belonging to the Blood Crips and, and other gangs that are violent. Uh, yes, they're 16 and 17 years old, but they're being held on charges because they've done something to the community. They've injured people. They 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 robbed. They created they they created havoc. And, you know, they ought to be in a facility and not allowed to, you know, to roam the streets, possibly, you know, doing uh, crimes again while they're awaiting a, a trial. And that's been known to happen. People on bail have been known to uh, commit crimes. But I do want to say, yes, the evidence has been that low-level offenders, people who have been arrested and then given bail who are misdemeanor offenders, 95% have returned to jail or have returned for their trial. Um, persons who are suspected of violent felonies have a tendency to not return uh, on t to return for their trial. And, and that's what's problematic. Yeah. Got to keep a close watch on that. We didn't get to talk about Mayor de Blasio's emails. We're out of time on this one. Uh, but listen, we'll get you back. Michael Benjamin, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us here on Open. Yeah, thank you. All righty. Listen, we got more shows. Stay tuned. We'll be right back right after this. Leaving hot coals improperly extinguished can cause a wildfire. Hey guys, it's smoky. It looks as if Smoky is going to use the drown, stir, drown, and feel technique. After the first drown, a good stir. Next, another drink. And finally, a close feel. Is it cool? cool? Okay. Yeah. Hey, Smoky, catch. Oh, my bad, Smoky. Only you can prevent wildfires. Open up your books to page 360. Did you just look at your phone while you was in class? You played yourself. Talking about inspirational quotes. You gotta believe in yourself. Don't ever play yourself. The key is to make it, so make it. Louise, Louise, can you give me an example of an inspirational quote? Don't play yourself. The key is to make it. And who said that? I did. Now that's a major key alert. Learn the real major keys to getting to college at getschool.com. I'm only 17, but I know about investing. Believe in something, buy shares in it, watch it grow. So what if you could invest in the future? The future of kids, like a stock. Not the kind of stock that's about making money, but a stock for social change. A whole new kind of investment called Better Futures. When you invest, it helps kids go to college. I could be one of the first college graduates from my family, the first philanthropist from my neighborhood. And if I'm the first, then maybe there's a second and a third. Believe in us, invest in us, watch us grow. My name is Sydney and I'm your dividend. Well, thank you for staying with us. I want you to know that falls are the leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries for older Americans. 
a serious threat, but they're often preventable. Now, joining us now to tell, share a little bit more about this is Laudry Lamadou, who's the Deputy Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Community Services, and welcome. Hi. Good to have you here. Good. So when we talk about falls, as we said, it's something that, you know, younger people do, we all do. But when it comes to the life of senior citizens, it's a little bit more prevalent and has a little bit more serious. Yes. Um, so as you age, of course, you know, um, there are issues with mobility, um, agility, and just flexibility. And these are, and muscle weakness. And those are some of the symptoms are, um, that cause falls. In addition to that, taking medications. So having to take more than four medications is also a risk factor for falls. Um, and so as we age, it's important that we uh, look at our, our environment, especially in our homes. Most falls take place in the home. Mm -hmm. So um, it's important to, you know, we do things like winterize our cars, baby-proof our homes. Um, and so we need to think about um, fall-proofing our homes as we age. Mm -hmm. So talk about fall precautions. What can we do to help with fall precautions, particularly if we have someone that's elderly in our house? What, what are some of the things that we can do? Um, the first thing to do is declutter your home. So you want to look yeah, at, big. yeah, <laughs> that is big, yeah. Um, especially, you know, as we get older, we collect things, you know, and they mean something to us and we want to hold on to them. Um, but make sure we store them in, in, in safe places and they're not around. Also, things like rugs. Rugs are a big issue. Um, you know, look around. Do you really need that rug? But if you, do, if you, if you really need that rug, make sure you have a non-slip um, um, mat under it so that it's not slipping. Um, also, grab bars. Install grab bars um, in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, the bathroom is the second place that people fall. The bedroom is the first place. Um, install night lights around um, the entryways. Um, and also exercise. Exercise is very important. I know that as we get older, people feel like, um, you know, I'm, I'm having joint pains, I have arthritis, um, but exercise is actually the best thing to help in terms of dealing with those kinds of things. And at our senior centers, we offer evidence-based programs that address falls, such as Tai Chi for arthritis, Stay Active and Independent for Life, A Matter of Balance, and all these programs are free. Mm -hmm. And so you got a special program coming up too, right? Yeah, so um, actually we recently, it was Falls Prevention Day on September 22nd. Mm -hmm. So uh, the New York City Department for the Aging along with the New York City Department of Mental Health and Hygiene are the co-chairs of the New York City Falls Coalition. And we put together over 45 events um, one of them being a Tai Chi for Arthritis uh, event that took place at Bronx Works Innovative Senior Center. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it was a Facebook Live on our page. And talk about the response from people. I mean, when you talk about falls, obviously it's not something that we always have conversation about. Mm -hmm. Are more and more people having these conversations? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, people are becoming more aware. We've been having the falls prevention annual, the annual falls prevention for the last 11 years. So um, we're tasked with getting the word out and I think people are more aware of it and are becoming not only aware of the things inside their homes but also outside. So uh, within New York City, we've done things like making sure that the sidewalks are more level so people aren't tripping. Um, you know, in terms of even having more rest places for older adults as they walk so if they feel faint or anything like that they can sit down and rest. So it's a big issue and um, people are becoming more and more aware of it. So for people who want to find out more information, what do they do? So they can go to um, DIFTA's website at www.nyc.gov slash aging and look under services. And certainly put that information at the bottom of the screen. So there is uh, some things that you can do. Uh, now the Tai Chi class, when mm -hmm. is that? So um, the Tai Chi class already took place, but if you're interested in a Tai Chi class, please call 311 and, um, for your local senior center and ask them when they'll be having the next um, um, Tai Chi class or any class that addresses falls. Wow. Laudry Lamadou, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. Thank you. I want to let you know that one in four Americans ages 65 and up actually experience falls. So if you can get some information, go ahead and get it. And as you said, 
uh, contact the organization, and I'm sure they'll provide you with the much-needed resources for that. Now, listen, got to take a quick break. We thank Audrey, Audrey for joining us, and we want you to stay with us. We'll be right back with some more Open coming up right after this. Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes. But with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. mm. <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have pre-diabetes. Big time. The angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. And welcome back. We want to let you know the second annual Bronx Alzheimer's Walk just passed in a very important event. It took place recently, and uh, we want to let you know all about that. Also want to let you know that the Alzheimer's Caregiver Link Program, it's a very special program that's being sponsored by RAIN. RAIN is raising awareness about the illness. And here to share a little bit more about RAIN, we welcome now Marianne Pavashish, as well as Vice President of Few Human Resources and Compliance. And then we also welcome Roberto Reyes, Program Manager at Alzheimer's Caregiver Link Program. How'd I do? Good, good, great. I did good. Thank you for having I got the us. pronunciation right? You got it right. You told me I'm the man, right? You're the man, man. Uh, so far, so far. <laughs> good to have you. Listen, I want to get right into this to talk a little bit about, uh, and we just did this, we just talked in the last segment, and there's uh, some ways that the last segment and this segment correlate. So let me start with that first. Great. So the RAIN has been around for, 20, for 52 years. We are a comprehensive social service agency. We run about 25 different programs and 13 different centers. Mm -hmm. And to touch upon your previous guest, we actually do our fall prevention in one senior centers. Mm -hmm. We teach our seniors how to prevent falls in house and around the city. Um, at the same time, uh, rain is growing dramatically. We have a home care piece of our business. We have a housing, we have a mills on wheels. Senior centers will have a custodian cook. So we're always looking for a new and fresh blood somebody who is either in the initial stage of the career or they would like to continue their career. And we offer a great program where we bring our employees in, evaluate their needs, evaluate their wants, and then guide them for the process of establishing their career path if they're in an early stage. 
whether they want to go to college. We, we partner with Lima, we partner with hostels, we, we send them out to continue education. Uh, home care aides, we have a pet set up for them to go to a nursing school. So Bronx is, uh, RAIN is an agency that loves Bronx. Mm -hmm. Bronx loves RAIN. And we try to do what we can to help Bronxians improve their lifestyle, improve their social status, as well as health. And Roberto, you're doing a very serious program, and sensitive program is too. We talk about Alzheimer's, and uh, not just Alzheimer's patients, but really the caregivers. And many times, uh, when you're caring for people, whether it's dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, it wears you out. And I know that you have the opportunity to really provide services there for caregivers. Yes, we do. Um, you know, it's it, we already know it's an insidious disease, and it it creeps in on you. And it, if you've never taken care of someone, in general, mm -hmm. you know, if people don't realize how stressful that can be actually taking care of somebody 100 percent of the time now multiply that by a factor of 10 with somebody with alzheimer's you know it's it, you're, you have to constantly watch this person the person is prone to wandering the person is is prone to um to falling mm -hmm. you know they it, it it's just one thing builds on the other and you know it if you've seen one case of alzheimer's you've only seen one case it doesn't affect two people the same way and you know, caregivers often are providing care for a loved one, and sometimes it's in a not-so-loving way. You know, I can't believe i got to help this guy put his pants on today. I can't believe i got to feed him. You know, it's, you know, we're talking about people who are going into their golden years, and this was not the dream that they had going into these golden years. So we provide a safe space where they can get these things off their chest, never in a judgmental way. And, you know, we, we have the professionals in place to help them every step of the way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of services that you provide right here at RAIN. Uh, and so for people who want to find out more information, obviously, uh, they can contact RAIN. Uh, but talk to us a little bit about getting out into the community, because I know that you guys are always engaging the community and letting us know what's happening with you as well. We do a lot of outreach to our local areas. We do a lot of health fair mm -hmm. where we speak to Bronxians of all ages and, and do health assessments. We do a lot of Alzheimer walk kind of events. We attend the community meetings. We attend senior housing. We try to be out there and, and make sure that community understands we are there for them and services we offer. Something as simple as opening a mail and reading what's junk, what's important, to something as important as guiding you through immigration complications of family benefits. So we do a lot of outreach through all the local elected officials, which we thank. We do a lot of outreach to hospitals, senior communities, uh, town hall meetings, as well as our internal centers. Mm -hmm. And so for people who want more information about your program, what do they do? Well, they can contact me directly via email. It's roberto.reyes at rainink.org, or they can call me on my cell phone, which is probably on all the time. <laughs> um, I, my battery dies quite a bit, but the email is the best. I'm usually pretty good at getting back at them, you know, within 24 hours. Um, or visit your local RAIN center, and anyone there will be able to direct you toward me. And I said specifically caregivers, and sometimes it's yes. hard for even a caregiver to come forward and say, I need some assistance. Do you find that? All the time. I mean, we're talking about a disease that's severely stigmatized. Nobody identifies with the word caregiver. I mean, taking care of mom is just what I'm going to do. Right. You know, she gave me life. I'm, I'm not a caregiver. That's my mom. You know, so it, it, getting people to wrap their minds around the whole concept of caregiving is something that's, you know, it, it's, it's a barrier in its own. Um, but, but caregivers can, can absolutely come and get the help that they need. Some, something as simple as, you know, I need... I need an identification product for mom, or do I need a meal to get to her because I can't get you know home in time to prepare something for her. I can't have her starving all day. So, I mean, we, we do so much, and people still just don't know. If I had a nickel for every time somebody said, I wish I would have known that, I mean, I'd be living comfortably in the Caribbean somewhere. <laughs> yeah, a lot of information that sometimes people don't yes. know, and at the same time, don't take advantage of. And Marion, for, for the people who are out there right now, just if you have seniors, if you have you know, questions or activities. RAIN is the place that you can go. They can have activities as well as, you know, health, information, and, and even, you know, whatever social services. You talk about immigration as well. I mean, we do. We do. Um, seniors are much more active nowadays than used to be before. Mm -hmm. So we have a Tai Chi, yoga, dancing, painting, computer classes. It's, it's amazing. They are better shape than I am, obviously, <laughs> you know, and they do a lot of mm -hmm. things more. 
So, but also we offer service like case worker, case assistance, case management, Alzheimer management. So, so we offer all those additional services. We are truly a, a one-stop shop for any need that you might have as far as, uh, you know, your, your family benefits, your work, your, your, your health, whatever. And, and the best way to approach us is to through our website, raininc.org, or just call us at 718-239. 4358 and tell them Marian sent you. You're right. You're all right. You're Mary's right. a man. Thank you so much. Pleasure having you. Good to have you, Pleasure. Roberto. Thank you. Thank you so much. We want to encourage people to take advantage of the services that are being provided by Reigns, particularly if you want to get more information about the Alzheimer's Caregiver Link program, please uh, contact Roberto. Take a quick break. Got more open coming up. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Patriotism. It inspires passionate debate. It's worn like a badge of honor with good reason, because it means love and devotion for one's country. But what really makes up this country of ours? It's the people. To love America is to love all Americans. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love, love beyond age, sexuality, disability, race, religion, and other labels, because love has no labels. You think getting dumped by text is harsh? Try getting dumped by a tennis ball. My ex owner drove me out to the woods, yelled fetch, and by the time I bought the ball back, he was gone. Yeah, I was pissed. <laughs> but the folks at the shelter helped me let go of my anger. I learned coping skills, like taking it to the hole. Boom! Now I'm ready to fetch again. But how about I throw and you run and get it? Hmm. Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. Love it. Cross-referencing travel sites. And booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh, But now they're like... <laughs> Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Our neighbors and best friends. I love my sister. My heart, my heart doesn't see race. race. Love, love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. Like minded people, NYC is an organization inviting you and your family to come on out and celebrate the cultural wealth that exists right here in New York City. And here to share with us a little bit more are the co-founder of Like-Minded People NYC, Christian Kumtag, and Shah St. Cyr. We thank you so much for coming and being with us again. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Good thank to have you. you again. Anytime we bring you back, that means good things are happening. <laughs> so good to have you back. Thank you, sir. Thank Listen. you. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's always a, a, a blessing to, to be given an opportunity to speak with the community. And this is what Like-Minded is all about, reaching out to... New Yorkers and uh, and making sure that we understand the the importance of um, of building a sustainable community and and this is like exactly what we do we we think of initiatives and events that will bring different cultures together mm -hmm. um, we do art exhibitions 
we do actually right here in, in, in the Bronx at Mulali Park, we have a soccer tournament once a year uh, that involves not only Africans but uh, Caribbeans and South Americans. Just we love soccer, so why not have an event and not just play but exchange and, and keep in touch and see how we could build upon um, those type of interaction and um, our latest event which is the, the Aquaba Picnic. Mm -hmm. And that's coming up on Saturday, October 13th. Yes, it is. This is an opportunity for not just waving at your neighbor, but coming out and actually having a plate from their country. So you get an opportunity to taste and mingle and learn about the ethnicities that uh, we rarely get to commingle with in New York City, except for perhaps riding on the train. Mm -hmm. And so this picnic is taking place Saturday, October 13th. I want you to come on out. It's uh, Commodore Perry Park, and uh, that's gonna where the events are going to be taking place. And as you said, what do you get a chance to infuse culture? You know, there's so many different cultures across New York City, so many different people that you have an opportunity to meet. What's the conversation like? What's the interaction like, given the fact that you have this great infusion of various cultures right here in our borough? It's pretty interesting that we say that because typically people go straight to current events. Mm -hmm. What's happening in the United States, what's going on on the news, and that is very important, but we never really get an insight as to what's going on in other people's countries. I mean, there are zip codes in New York City that actually have every nationality in the world, and you don't really get an opportunity to do that, so we're trying to provide that platform. Mm -hmm. We try to take it to the, to the next level, like even us being co-founders, he's, he's Haitian, American, I'm from the Republic of Chad. You know, I'll ask you, how many people you, do you know from Chad? One. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny is we, we have a large um, Chadian, people from Chad are called Chadian, community mm -hmm. in the Bronx and Left Rock City. So it's, uh, again, this concept that this is the most diverse um, uh, city right. ever. And, and what's interesting is we were invited to... Um, Gracie mentioned last week uh, mm -hmm. the mayor uh, right. of New York had an African heritage event at uh, Gracie mentioned and to celebrate the African culture and he sees the importance of diversity and he also sees the, import the importance and the impact Africans have uh, and that can apply to any community. You know, we, I come from Chad. I've been here for 17 years. I came here when I was 17. Mm. You know, that was two years ago. And... <laughs> <laughs> you did a lot of good work in two years, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but really pushing people to understand that we are, first of all, humans. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not our choice. I was born in Chad. You were born here. Uh, now that we are here in New York, take the time to see uh, what else is out there, you know, pushing people to think outside the box, outside of your community. You will never know what great things may happen, and, and that's also the power, power of networking. Right. I mean, we got millions of people here in New York City, of course. You know, in the Bronx alone, 2.4 million yes. people right here. We know about Brooklyn. But when you talk about it, there's a great amount of diversity, but there's also a great amount of segregation. But I, I want to ask you this question about cultural wealth, because that, okay. that's a word that comes up. So, so when we talk about cultural wealth, what does that mean to you? Uh, cultural wealth, uh, in certain ways, means diversity and similarities. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many things that, uh, based on the migration of so many people, there's an unawareness of how many things that were very similar. Uh, if you look at uh, Greeks, Macedonians, uh, they have similar dishes and so forth. And when we actually have our events, there are dishes, there are games that we tend to play that people didn't even know existed in other countries. Uh, so that formulates rapport, camaraderie with, uh, with our neighbors, with people in New York City. And that cultural influence is something that really starts breaking the barriers and creating somewhat of, not that segregation, mm -hmm. but that opportunity for us to actually gather. And let's tell people, you know, once again, you want to talk about gathering together. Listen, the picnic is taking place on October the 13th at 2 p.m. People have the opportunity to come. 
Uh, so there'll be plenty of food, plenty of games. We're and saving a plate for you. You're gonna save a plate for me. Yes. Make sure got, and, and the whole crew. And the whole crew. Everyone that means we got that means we gotta infiltrate. Put more down of it. Just I want to really add that one thing that's really funny also by being in New York is that we are trying to push is, you know, we live in Brooklyn, but trust us, if there is anything that will change our life or anything amazing happening in the Bronx, we will come to the Bronx to enjoy the event, whatever is happening, we'll be there. And that's one thing that I've noticed, New Yorkers, I'm from Brooklyn, nah, I don't do, um, I don't do the Bronx, yeah. I don't do Harlem, you know, and. We stayed our own borough. Exactly, and this is one thing besides just pushing uh, um, the uh, you know the the love of other culture, the love of other borough. You know, we try to do events everywhere. We do. Um, we also have a partnership. Well, last year we had a partnership with the African Film Festival, mm -hmm. when movie makers, African film producers, come to New York to showcase the film. They they go to Lincoln Center, they have a viewing, and they go home. Mm -hmm. So we thought about creating an event. After the viewing, we had an event in Harlem at, um, what's, the, what's the, the? In Harlem. In Harlem. In Harlem. <laughs> in Harlem. <laughs> I mentioned the name. Uh, Gene, right, Gene right. Oh, we don't want to promote right, it. Right, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah uh, we had in an Harlem. event in Harlem because the first part of the uh, viewing was at Lincoln Center. So after the, the the viewing of the movies, everyone town. came. Yeah. Movie lovers and filmmakers got to interact and network. And we did a similar event in Brooklyn mm -hmm. because the second part of the African Film Festival was at BAM. Uh -huh. So we had an event at BAM. But yeah, we take advantage of New York City overall culture wise, you know, um, borough wise, we try to, to, to push folks out. I'm up against the clock before we leave. How do people get in touch with you guys? If they want to participate in the event, or just know more about like-minded. Just remember the initials. L-M-P-N-Y-C. That's it. One. The number one. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank All you right. for having us. Thank you. No, good, good, good to see you again. Good to see you again. Nice seeing you again. All right, then. Listen, I want to let you know. Come on, take advantage of the event. It is Saturday, October 13th, and it's going to be at Commodore Barry Park. Uh, and that's going to be on Flushing Avenue, North Elliott Place in Brooklyn. And that's where we see all the various cultures, all the various boroughs coming together. Listen, we've come to the end of our show today. want to thank all of our guests for joining us. Most of all, I want to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recable Cast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimus Channel 67, Verizon Files. I should say that's Channel 33. Or you can watch us anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. Giving a big shout out to all of our viewers and watchers, particularly my sister. I know who's watching right now. Listen, watching MNN, and we want to give a shout out to all those on the MNN network who's also watching us as well. For all of us here on the set of Open, I'm Darren Hyman saying take care, God bless, and remember, pink is for breast cancer awareness. Month. So please remember those who've been uh, affected by breast cancer awareness to do your best to spread the word. Take care, keep this channel wide open. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. One eighty over one eleven. One sixty over one ten. I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it, or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. Why don't you ever see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're really good at it. <laughs> yeah, I get it.